Welcome back to PatBar LSAT Prep. In this video, we continue our presentation of Section 4 of Prep Test 76. Question 10 presents Richard and Young Su discussing abstract art. Richard says it will eventually be considered an aberration, while Young Su argues that it is part of the mainstream. Specifically, over what point do they disagree? We can eliminate A immediately since they both agree on this point. It can't be B, because Jung Su doesn't argue representation in general, but of what abstract art represents. C may or may not be factual, but Richard doesn't mention musicians. Did you pick D? So have a lot of people, and it's wrong. Jung Su specifically makes the argument for the mainstream, whatever others might come to say. That means that they agree over the perception by others, and D is incorrect. Richard argues that abstract art doesn't represent. Jung Su argues that it does represent, but represents the formal features of an object in place of the everyday perspectives. E is the point of contention and the correct response. Question 10 is an excellent example of why we don't rush through the test. Many people have chosen D because it looks correct. Sometimes these questions are as easy as they look, but if you're asking yourself whether you're missing something, follow that instinct. Question 11 presents a set of principles. Who should be blamed for misfortune and why, and who should not and why? You are to take the principles, assume they are valid, and again, this point is important. If you are told to assume something you do for purposes of the problem, and pick in which scenario those principles most justify the reasoning. The first fragment of A disqualifies it from consideration, because if you would have realized something had you thought about it, you cannot be absolved of blame under the principles presented. If you're concerned that something might be a problem but you have no reason to believe it, it can't meet the principle of knowingly causing misfortune. C is incorrect. There are several problems with D. Remember, the principles we have to work with include knowingly equals blame, and D suggests no one knowingly affected this one patient. That means we have insufficient detail to assign blame to anyone. The given principles cannot be applied to D. E makes perfect sense in your head, and if you chose it, you left behind the application of the given principles. The only one that supports should be blamed is knowingly causing misfortune. That Cap did not realize this means the first principle is not met. The cases in which the passage argues for absolution of blame are unwittingly bringing about misfortune and could not reasonably have foreseen that misfortune, and only B satisfies both these principles. Question 12 presents a researcher stating that, since inhaling lavender scent tends to reduce stress, and since intense stress can make a person more susceptible to illness, reduced illness among those who inhale lavender scent is likely you are to choose which response is a required assumption to make the argument work. Required assumption, as you will recall, means the argument fails without it. First, let's eliminate the irrelevant. The passage is specific to lavender, so whether any other scents have any effect is entirely unnecessary. That some people who use lavender scent to reduce stress are no more susceptible than average to illness is entirely possible, and entirely irrelevant. It doesn't speak to the argument that the incidence is likely reduced. D is cause and effect, but it is not a requirement. Assume the opposite, that using lavender scent reduces susceptibility to illness, but primarily for some reason other than reducing stress. Does it destroy the argument that the use of the scent likely leads to reduced incidence of illness? It does not, and is not correct. E is simply wrong. This assumes lavender would help only those people under enough stress to impair their immune systems. This weakens the argument that lavender would likely help anyone regularly inhaling the scent. If no one who uses lavender scent would otherwise be stressed enough to impair their immune systems, 
this would cause the argument to fail. B is the correct response. Question 13 presents government statistics showing that the average family's income has gone up over the last five years, says the Anderson family's is average this year, and concludes theirs must have gone up. We get a legitimately easy one here. To find the flaw in the reasoning, two words stand out, this year. If we're constrained to this year, we don't know with the data we're given whether the Andersons earned more or less in the past. D is the flaw and the correct answer. Question 14 notes that certain methods of making counterfeit banknotes involve taking accurate measurements of images on those banknotes. The conclusion suggests that if some of those images are made difficult to measure, counterfeiting will be prevented. This is a bit of a leap. The conclusion seems to suggest that all counterfeiting would be prevented by stopping certain methods, specifically making images more difficult to measure. The correct answer needs to complete the connection between hard-to-measure images and preventing counterfeiting. It hurts the conclusion to assume that better copying technology means greater precision, which would have to translate into better measurements. A is just wrong. Three of our answers don't have any effect. If a government has better printing technology than we do, it doesn't mean ours isn't good enough to do the job. That few countries print hard-to-counterfeit images means nothing. We're trying to complete the connection between hard-to-measure and preventing counterfeiting. That new designs mean less counterfeit currency tells us nothing since we're not told whether those new designs include harder-to-measure images. To get from hard-to-measure images to preventing counterfeiting, we have to assume it is the only thing stopping you, the only impediment. B is correct. For question 15, Armstrong claims that Dr. Sullivan is acting in self-interest when arguing for nutritional supplements rather than pharmaceuticals to treat a particular disease since he is paid to endorse a line of nutritional supplements. Armstrong argues that, therefore, those supplements should not be used for that treatment. You are tasked with finding the flaw in Armstrong's argument. This one should be fairly straightforward, but let's eliminate anyway. Armstrong appears to use the word supplements consistently. Armstrong argues that we should not rely on Sullivan as an authority, though this does highlight the nature of the actual flaw. Armstrong's is flawed reasoning and has nothing to do with emotions. And Armstrong argues should not, not cannot. D is the flaw. Armstrong is attacking the perceived reason behind Sullivan's argument, not the argument itself. Question 16 features an economist's argument that more parents will need daycare for their children in a stronger economy, that daycare workers will get better jobs in a stronger economy, and that, therefore, daycare will be harder to find. You're to find the assumption required to make the argument work. At the risk of repeating ourselves, a required assumption problem means only the correct answer would destroy the argument if it is not true. Let's eliminate two of them immediately. It's irrelevant if most new jobs in a stronger economy pay well because the only jobs we care about to meet the conclusion are daycare jobs. Only if daycare workers quit for better paying jobs will a shortage of daycare get worse? This passage doesn't make this argument and makes no difference. Why would fewer children in daycare if the cost increases matter? Assume the opposite, that the number would increase anyway. A higher number coupled with fewer workers would help the argument. This is the opposite of a requirement and E is incorrect. C supports the argument, but is it a requirement? If the opposite is true, that the number of daycare workers would go up, we're told to expect the number of kids to increase anyway, and the conclusion is still possible. If B is false, that there will be a noticeably higher number of daycare workers in a stronger economy, this causes the argument that daycare will be more difficult to find to fall apart, and is the correct response. 
Question 17 presents a set of facts comparing ostrich farming and cattle ranching. We're told that ostriches reproduce much faster and require far less acreage, and that a cattle ranch requires a large herd of cows, one bull, and a minimum two acres per cow. The conclusion is that starting an ostrich farm costs more, but eventually can bring five times the income. So which answer is most strongly supported by that data? Let's get two of them out of the way. We can't compare the average ostrich farm to the average cattle ranch unless we know how long the ostrich farm has been running. Eventually could be a long time. Just because an ostrich farm will eventually be better does not mean a cattle ranch is not good. E is a maybe at best. Sure, startup costs for an ostrich farm are higher, but we're not given anything that precludes a profit that first year. C may have made you pause a moment. We've been told about acreage, not feed. Not only can the data not support this, but if you postulated that more acreage per animal translates into more feed per animal, the opposite would make sense. We're told that starting an ostrich farm is more expensive, but cattle ranching requires more land, and the real estate and the animals are the only details we're really given. A new cattle ranch means a large herd of cows and one bull, and two acres per animal, and we know land isn't cheap. Since a new ostrich farm requires four ostriches and one acre, and the startup costs for the ostrich farm is higher, we have to assume that the ostriches are more expensive than the cattle. A is correct. Question 18 postulates that since hairless dogs do not exist in the wild and could not have traversed the mountainous region between western Mexico and the coast of Peru, some of them must have been taken from one site to the other by people in boats. One of the five assumptions is required for the argument to work. A makes no difference. If the opposite were true, that hairless dogs were found elsewhere, the conclusion can still work. So what if most trade goods came by boat to western Mexico? Assuming the opposite has no effect on whether hairless dogs arrived that way from Peru. C seems to suggest that the dogs could only have arrived as part of a trading expedition, which would seem to make their relocation even more difficult. We need a requirement, not a hindrance. Not only is D completely irrelevant, but again, it would reduce that likelihood of relocation if the dog's purpose was as a means of exchange. So the one requirement that collapses the argument if not true. If travel by boat was not easier centuries ago, the argument that they must have come by boat makes no sense. E is the correct response. In our next video, we will present questions 19 through 25 of Section 4 of PrepTest 76.